two meetings we had um, in Switzerland, and I, I really enjoyed uh, his talk. And I think it would be would be a great a great speaker for this um, data science uh, opening. So uh, just to say a few words, I could spend all your time. <laughs> And that's all when I go through your whole CV, it, it has so many interesting points. So he actually started with chemistry in Frankfurt. He uh, has a PhD from ETH in Zurich, and he had lots of academic positions uh, in the US uh, and also in Europe. Um, so in the last years, he was um, uh, in, in Basel and uh, very recently, uh, I actually found out only at the time when I looked up uh, Anatol for inviting him, uh, he actually switched um, to the University of uh, Vienna. So um, Anatol is well known for his research at the border of um, theoretical chemistry and machine learning. Um, he has won several prizes. Um, he has an ERC consolidator grant and he has a Google unrestricted research grant. I don't want to know what that actually means. <laughs> so it looks like um, a good situation for doing interesting work. And um, yeah, Anatol, we are really happy that you accepted to be here and uh, give uh, a presentation to us and, and uh, shed some light into this interesting field at the at the interface of data science, machine learning, and chemistry and physics. So with this, um, I think we switch the slides. So uh, we will look at yours, which are probably more interesting than mine. And um, looking forward um, to your talk. Thank you, Matthias. Um, I started sharing my slide. I, I hope that's OK. That works now. Um, so it's, it's really a pleasure to, to, uh, to be virtually with you all and, uh, and to be given this, um, this opportunity to share a little bit um, uh, the things we've uh, been doing. So I, I think uh, I, I didn't know uh, about Dash and um, Giga and um, it sounds really exciting and I hope uh, that um, this uh, this talk um, does justice to um, uh, these ambitious goals. So um, <clears throat> we 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 are really interested in um, in chemical compound space. And I'll, I'll try to um, briefly motivate um, uh, things for that, um, um, but I'll I'll also um, I want to share some of the more recent results uh, which, which we uh, have published or um, which uh, are about to be published. Um, so um, the chemical compound space is uh, used in, in many uh, ways uh, as, as a, a term and um, uh, we um, uh, like to use uh, quantum mechanics to understand this um, and uh, Within quantum mechanics, we, we try to um, rely on regression techniques, uh, so modern statistical learning. Uh, uh, but uh, we also like to use uh, perturbation theory to explore the space. And so all of that um, really uh, positions us at, at an interesting interface between computing uh, even high performance computing um, between uh, theoretical chemistry and physics and uh, uh, possible application areas, uh, maybe uh, in materials. Um, so there's a lot of interest, of course, in renewable energy solutions. For many years, I worked for um, national labs in the US, um, funded by the Department of Energy. Um, so these materials um, questions, uh, the materials design questions are, are very um, uh, of high interest. Um, but uh, due to the fundamental nature of things, of course, all, uh, all matters made up of atoms, um, one could even also venture into biological applications. Uh, um, but um, so typically we, 
in our work, we stay more on the on the fundamental side of things. And the hope is then, of course, to connect with um, the corresponding collaborators to uh, more relevant applications. Um, <clears throat> so there's a little bit um, as an outset now um, to uh, maybe more specifically um, motivate this. This was a slide actually, uh, which was shown by Alan Asburu Butsik, who's also a, a very important um, scientist um, working on this, uh, this area of uh, robotics and AI for, for chemistry. Um, he showed this um, slide at, uh, at the workshop, at the workshop where, where Matthias and I met um, in, in Switzerland uh, two years ago. And um, it's, it's from Barron's, a snapshot from the journal here. Barron's is the weekly um, issue of, of uh, the Wall Street Journal. Um, and there's a, a bold uh, estimate for the next decade of course predicting the future is, is always tricky, but um, um, uh, these people are not shy to do so. And they think uh, gene editing, quantum computing and materials on demand are, are the, um, among those topics that will, will be important. Um, the, the materials on demand is, was interesting because it actually mentioned a simulation and virtual optimization uh, prior to going to the experiment. Uh, uh, this this uh, is getting more and more hold uh, throughout the, the communities that this is still something to happen for the chemical sciences that you would like to optimize things on a computer before going into the lab to make them. Um, now, um, this is not uh, really something new, right? So already in the, in the 90s, in the late 90s, um, people have been thinking about this. And one of the seminal papers is uh, here, there's a paper Nature from uh, 99, where Franceschetti and Zunger um, <clears throat> sort of uh, provided a concept of, or discussed the concept um, where, um, they highlight that if, if you wish to, um, to perform materials design on a computer, you'd have to solve what is known as an inverse problem. Um, so when conventionally you would mimic the experiment in, uh, so the, the conventional physics-based approach is uh, to, to study a system and then predict its, its properties um, and predict uh, its processes. Um, and then you can, of course, falsify things and compare to experiment, right? That, that's what a proper science does, uh, is falsification. Um, so um, you would do this in, in the direct approach. So for us, it would mean you have some materials. So there's a unit cell of, of some um, crystal here. And um, you, you presume you, you represent that system. And then you can solve using the quantum mechanics, which um, so yeah, I'm I'm in Vienna here, and uh, Erwin Schrödinger was in this uh, in, in this same faculty, and uh, Ludwig Boltzmann, right? So we, we know a lot. Uh, we, we had a lot of time to uh, sort of digest these uh, these models of nature, and um, so now we have the computers that we can solve this, and you see we we can get something like the band structure, for instance, or other properties. Now. Uh, over many decades, people have uh, tried to improve uh, the solvers for these equations, to improve the approximations, and um, for many uh, compound classes and uh, compound properties, um, actually we do fairly well nowadays. So, so you can, uh, in many cases, you can uh, predict properties um, with um, error margins that resemble sort of the experimental uncertainty which you would have. And, so uh, that's, of course, when, when then uh, uh, no further theoretical development really makes sense, um, uh, unless you, you can turn things around and you can ask the question, well, if you're looking for material that has some properties, so suppose it, it's supposed to have some band structure, um, what, what should the atoms be, right? What, what should be the composition? What should be the structure? So this is the inverse problem, right? And, and um, <clears throat> it is a, a tricky problem. Um, so uh, these are um, names of, of scientists who have been working on this, uh, rather from the materials um, side. Uh, David Barrett is, a, is a, a chemist that 
at Duke University um, who, who contributed here, but um, most others are, are materials or, or solid state physicists. Um, now, uh, this is uh, uh, particularly tricky because uh, on top of uh, the forward question being, being hard to solve, um, uh, you, you usually, you don't have an analytic solution then for inverting that map. Um, and already the forward map is typically not analytical, right? So, so except for the very simplest model systems, you cannot really um, invert that map. It, it can be ill-defined in the sense that it's, it's not really an invertible function. You, you might have multiple very distinct and, and um, distant solutions it's a, an incredible high dimensional space. If you just, just consider this lattice of the crystal, right? And so you, you have hundreds of atoms sitting in this unit cell and any atomic side um, can be populated, at least in principle, by any element from the periodic table, right? So roughly speaking, we have 110 different chemical elements. So you would have something like 110 to the power of the number of sides in terms of combinations. Um, <clears throat> and that's of course a gigantic number. And this is uh, so what we, what we refer to when we say chemical compound space. Um, so um, a, a high dimension optimization problem is, is always uh, uh, very tough. Um, and then um, the forward problem, typically when, when using um, our physics-based methods is, is it's not cheap in the sense that you have to pay with CPU time and, and uh, compute time, as, as you're probably aware of, is not um, uh, an abandoned um, um, an, an abandoned property, and so uh, it's scarce, and you you will have to pay for it. So, um, <clears throat> so this is sort of a, a little bit, a, sort of a perfect storm, right? In terms of a, a tough problem, um, and uh, so I, I'm I'm always delighted. Uh, when uh, younger folks uh, can get interested in this because I, I honestly believe that we need all the help uh, we can get for this. Uh, so um, what you see in this box here though is, is some uh, formal solution you could write down, right? So you would like to minimize some uh, target property I, uh, which is uh, determined by the system. So the nuclear charges and the structure of all the atoms capital I. Um, you would like to minimize its deviation from some reference target property. Right? You might have multiple properties, so you, you might want to assign some weight to each property, and then you need to navigate this, this uh, what is known as a Pareto front. Pareto was a, a, a very famous uh, Italian um, scientist who contributed in many fields, and uh, so Pareto fronts are, are very, um, a very well-known concept in um, and numerical optimization and applied math. Now, um, so doing this minimization, of course, is very hard, right? And so um, this is a little bit the context within which we are trying to um, speed up things. So basically making, trying to make this less expensive um, by providing models that, that allow us to more rapidly predict um, the, these properties. And then um, you can use those models in order to iteratively try to solve this minimization problem. Um, <clears throat> so the, the toughest part of this, in, 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 at least in, in our work, what we focus on most is this uh, high dimensionality and uh, the behaviors in chemical compound space. And um, <clears throat> so if, if you're unfamiliar with chemical compound space, there was a nature um, inside uh, an entire issue um, and, uh, devoted just to this topic in 2004, which um, uh, might, uh, might be a good way to, to enter this topic. Um, uh, so this is uh, on the left, you see it from, from that paper. On the right, there was in, in 2017, um, uh, another comment um, on chemical compound space. Uh, including a, a nice histogram of the size, the number of compounds um, that are recorded in certain databases and uh, what is listed here is PubChem, uh, Zinc and GDB17. These are um, so-called legacy uh, databases of, of listing compounds. Um, now GDB17 uh, only contains the molecular graphs. Um, Zinc and PubChem uh, can contain coordinates. 
Um, these are virtual data sets, really um, approved drugs, so, so actually characterized compounds in, in, real, in, in reality. Um, uh, you see you have much, much less uh, of such compounds here. Um, and what people think is possible in terms of rules of combinatorics and simple um, chemical bonding rules like Lewis structures, um, for organic uh, medium-sized chemistry, right? So think aspirin, maybe cocaine, these, these kind of molecules, um, you would um, reach 10 to the 60. Right? Now, 10 to the 60 is, is so gigantic, it, it doesn't really make sense to, to talk about this. Um, so you have atoms in the solar system is up here, stars in the universe. Um, we like to give this example. We, we don't have enough atoms in the universe to um, uh, make the hard drive, which would store the list of these uh, 10 to the 60 compounds, not speaking about making them or, or characterizing them, right? Um, now, and, and that's just um, without, so that's only organic chemistry. Of course, we have all inorganic chemistry and, and the transition metals and, and, and et cetera. So um, this is really um, a, a huge search space and, um, it is uh, extremely relevant because there, there can be compounds in the space that uh, can really alter the, the fate of human mankind. Just think about penicillin. It was just discovered by accident and it really changed things, right? And um, so there might be more, more such surprises in this uh, space, which uh, humanity has simply not uh, discovered yet. And uh, so in some sense, we are, we are a little bit like uh, Europeans uh, before uh, Columbus. We, we don't even know what's what's around uh, in, in our universe. We, we don't really understand this. We are very, um, very much biased to the chemistries um, we know. And um, I, I would encourage you all to think about the possibilities of uh, completely new chemistries. Um, so <clears throat> in our work, we, we try to use um, uh, machine learning to um, uh, accelerate things and uh, quantum mechanics based understanding. And the idea is a little bit, or the focus lies on trying to exploit correlations in this compound space. And one um, obvious structure in this compound space, which is also actually shown uh, down here is uh, of course that there must be the underlying alphabet of the chemical elements, but then you could systematically um, build up um, also the environments. Uh, around each atom. So um, in this inset here, this comes from a, a graphic we produced for um, a, a paper which was published last year in Nature Chemistry. Um, you could think about it as a, a third dimension of the periodic table where, where in the third dimension, you, you add uh, the environment, the neighbors around each atom. And you can do this by uh, growing this environment. So more and more neighbors, and then uh, eventually, of course, you will have recovered the local chemistry of each uh, atom and all its possible chemistries. And now, if, if the property of interest, and uh, um, surprisingly, this is uh, quite often the case, if this property um, is locally, um, is dependent, if it depends only locally on, on your chemistry, then uh, it can be sufficient to have an additive scalable model that um, uh, sort of uh, puts together these, these fragments, if you wish. Um, and so this is what you see here. Uh, so down here, you, um, you see this uh, Nature Chemistry paper where uh, we published this idea. And what you see in this animation are the thousand most frequent such fragments in, in organic chemistry. Um, so it's a box of 10 by 10 by 10 uh, molecules. Um, and so the, the viewer flies through this. Um, on the left, you see an uh, illustration for the aspirin molecule. So the aspirin atoms are, are highlighted by, by the stars. And then on each aspirin atom, we superimpose um, uh, the same atom, but in a different molecule, right? So up here, for instance, you would have propanol um, uh, being superimposed with, the, with this oxygen and, and aspirin. And, and the argument is that there is some relationship, a, a quantitative correlation um, among the chemistries of uh, these atoms shared among different at, uh, molecules. And so um, if we have a, a, a statistical learning tool, we should be able to exploit such 
correlations. And we, we try um, also using quantum mechanics to better understand this. So, so here's a, a little um, uh, cycle how you could um, uh, exploit such a tool in order to uh, design things faster. So you, you would start out with a library of uh, initial compounds, solve uh, some quantum mechanics, get properties, train a machine on this, um, and then use the machine to explore vast spaces very rapidly and identify new candidates uh, for an updated library and then uh, uh, solve for them the quantum mechanics, etc. And you, you, if you um, cycle this loop uh, sufficiently long, uh, you should converge to some uh, nice materials, uh, um, optimal materials. Um, so this is a very general um, schematic um, story. So um, <clears throat> now we, we like to call this um, uh, quantum machine learning. And um, uh, in order to avoid the confusion um, in the field a little bit, there is also the use of uh, quantum machine learning in the sense of uh, in, in applications um, of quantum computing. Um, and there's a, on the Wikipedia um, entry, you will find this little table here where um, I think it nicely explains things. So um, uh, quantum machine learning is any one of these boxes here. Um, you can um, call the type of algorithm you're using. So uh, you, you can call this classical or quantum. So quantum algorithm could, uh, should be able to make use of quantum hardware, right? Um, and then the data you're studying can, can be classical um, uh, or it can be quantum. And um, so, our sort of uh, quantum machine learning falls in this box, this QC box. We, we have quantum data, we have quantum materials, um, but um, the machine learning we actually rely on is, is very classical. So um, <clears throat> this is a, a common convention in, in theoretical uh, chemistry and physics um, to um, use the prefix quantum when you study uh, quantum objects with uh, classical uh, methods. So for, for example, um, quantum Monte Carlo uses classical Monte Carlo moves in the uh, wave function um, coefficient space. Quantum Monte Carlo, uh, quantum molecular dynamics uh, does uh, Newtonian dynamics um, on uh, atoms using um, quantum forces. Um, so uh, this is uh, very common, and, and so an analogy to this, we, we like to use this term quantum machine learning, and the context should then clarify um, to the uh, reader what, what we are referring to. I should also ma uh, de uh, this, uh, make the clarification that um, using this acronym, we distinguish our little, ourselves a little bit from the more conventional, QSPR and QSAR approaches that are around for much, much longer times, right? Um, and they, they um, are of course, uh, they, they, they have uh, gigantic merits, but um, what our point is, uh, is rather to um, incorporate um, also the underlying quantum physics in the problem. In many um, bioinformatics approaches, you, you don't really need that. So um, uh, then you, you don't have to use QML, of course. Now, um, we, we um, uh, this is a friend of mine, Sergei Kalinin, he's an experimentalist at Oak Ridge, and he envies us uh, theoreticians because uh, according to him, theorists um, know everything. And uh, what he means is that um, we know where the atoms sit, we place them, right? It's our model, it's part of our model. You have a complete control as, as a, a theoretician, how you model your system, and. Uh, that's what he's re referring to. And, and I think um, that envy is to some degree um, quite justified um, because it, it really means that what we are doing um, in a, a very strict sense um, is to uh, do something called supervised learning. We have a causal relationship. Um, your material um, will have some properties which are a function of that material. Right? And, and um, so in, in quantum mechanics, that's uh, typically expressed then through Schrodinger's equation shown down here. So your Hamiltonian uh, represents the system and then you have to solve this um, eigenvalue equation and uh, the Hamiltonian is, is a differential operator. So this is a differential equation, but it's, it's very, um, um, very much a, a deductive thing, right? Um, 
Uh, uh, same for statistical mechanics. If, if you calculate your, your Boltzmann averages, this is um, uh, also, there's a clear cause and effect relationship. And we, we even know the structure of these equations, right? And so I argue that um, we can uh, exploit this um, uh, very much to, to our benefit. So um, including incorporating the, the right uh, physics um, as it is manifested in these fundamental equations um, it turns out to be really um, very beneficial for um, uh, the design and the, the construction of our machine learning models. Now, um, <clears throat> what, what is now chemical compound space in, in terms of quantum mechanics? And um, I've, I've picked here um, one of the, the most common approaches um, how this is uh, studied. Um, this is a cone charm equation, right? So um, you see for an electron I, you use a cone charm orbital phi, um, which uh, is of course spread out over the entire system, right? Um, so it's, it's a quantum description. The electron is not in one point, but all over the place. Um, and uh, this is a wave equation. It's also a Schrodinger equation, a single particle Schrodinger equation. So you have your, your kinetic operator term here. And then you have this uh, dubious cone charm potential, right? So this is the potential which then um, would lead to, to a potential energy. Um, and this uh, gives you an eigenvalue of, of uh, that, um, that uh, orbital. Um, now, in this uh, potential, right, um, we put all the dirt in, in this potential. All the many body effects are embedded in this potential. And um, we understand, to some degree, we understand this potential very well. It, consists of the external potential. It consists of uh, uh, an electronic repulsion uh, potential. There's a, this is just an um, um, electrostatic uh, repulsion between the electrons. And you have here the electron density, which means all other electrons yes, um, are encoded here. The electron density is the sum over all other Gonsham orbital squared. Um, and then you have the exchange correlation potential. And um, this is really um, the, the tricky part of this potential. Um, so a lot of research went into uh, finding improved approximations to um, this exchange correlation potential. There's proof that um, the exact potential exists, but nobody knows how it looks like. And so people try to find um, reasonable assumptions about this using empiricism or using theoretical physics. Um, but for um, our um, context here, let's assume you have some uh, decent approximation for this. Um, uh, what uh, really encodes your, your system, your, your molecule or your material is um, the external potential here. And the external potential is just the, um, uh, again, a Coulomb uh, attraction between your nuclei of the atoms. So the um, nuclear charge Z, uh, this is the atomic number on the periodic table, right? It records how many protons you have in your uh, nucleus of the atoms. So this is what the electrons will feel. They, they will be attracted to this. Um, and this attraction decays with one over R. Um, so, um, what you see here now in this single term is uh, the nuclear composition and the coordinates of so the structure of your system. That's where it is encoded. This is how it enters um, uh, quantum mechanics, right? So as you go through chemical compound space, you are varying Z and R, capital R. That's, that's what you're doing, right? Um, and for any um, such combination, you can solve this Schrodinger equation and get a different answer. So this means uh, chemical compound space um, uh, really scales with four Ni, where Ni is the, the number of atoms. And you have the three dimension for the coordinates. And the fourth dimension is for the nuclear charge, the Z. Right? So the fourth dimension is, is not really a real number. Um, <clears throat> in reality, of course, it's, it's a national number and no, no larger than 110. But um, uh, for theory, actually, we can also have fractional nuclear charges. Um, you can solve uh, quantum mechanics for fractional nuclear charges. Um, that is, has, of course, no correspondence in reality, but you can still extract meaningful um, physics out of it and meaningful properties, right? So think about it as, as a, a very coarse approximation to reality. Um, even such coarse approximations can still be helpful in, in guiding decisions. 
Um, and then you have this one here, um, this one additional dimension is the number of electrons, right? So in a neutral, uh, charge neutral system, your, uh, the sum of all your protons uh, must be equal to the, the number of electrons. Um, uh, now you can have different charges, so the number of electrons can, can vary, but typically it, it doesn't vary much. So it's, it's plus or minus uh, one or two or three maybe. Um, so it's not, it's also not a real dimension, if you wish, or it's, it's not a dimension that is uh, being fully sampled in reality. Now, um, <clears throat> the number of atoms in your system, of course, can be very large. If you think about a, a protein like insulin, right? Uh, so then you can have millions of atoms. So, so this is um, the, the problem, right? This, this kind of dimensionality. Um, with which you, you will have to cope as you explore the space. Now in that space, right? So if, if I take all my coordinates and my nuclear charges and my number of electrons, these are my independent variables, any compound would be a point. Um, and here, so here, for example, I have N2. Um, and uh, so this view is also summarized in a review I wrote a couple of years ago, uh, if you want to read up more on this. Now, um, in this space, you can vary the nuclear charges, right? So N2 um, would be neighbored by uh, carbon monoxide, BF, beryllium, neon, um, or you do it in, in the other side, in the other direction. So, so you have your two nuclear charges of N2 at Z equals seven, you change one to eight, the other one to six at CO, or the other way around is OC, and, and that's of course symmetric, right? So your potential energy, um, which you can calculate by solving uh, the cohen sharm equation, uh, the electronic part to your potential energy really looks like um, this inverted parabola. And on this ridge here, you see the binding curve of N2, okay? Um, and if you go to a different uh, nuclear charge combination, then you see the binding curve of CO and, and uh, BF, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is to show you that chemical compound space in terms of quantum mechanics is actually quite smooth. It's, it's not a crazy idea to say, I'm gonna Taylor expand in here. I'm gonna do a regression in this space, right? Um, now, of course, in reality, um, you will have, you will measure um, an equilibrium distance. So only one point and you will measure it for a certain composition, right? So, so you might think you might be fooled into believing this space is discrete somehow, but uh, quantum mechanics, our understanding of matter, which is reflected by quantum mechanics, um, tells us that um, within our understanding, that space is, is perfectly smooth. Um, now, there are interesting relationships, right? And I, I just mentioned Taylor expansions and uh, perturbation theory is uh, basically nothing else than a Taylor expansion. So here um, you see this from uh, a different paper, this is from this uh, FISREF research we published last year. If you take N2, this is the electron density, and then you perturb it towards CO or, or BF, right? Then you get these perturbed electron densities as a function of order. So this is the first, second, third, fourth um, derivative of the electron density, and you pile them up as a Taylor expansion, and you can predict the electron density of CO or BF based on um, N2 and its expansion in, in, the, um, in its derivatives. Um, so you see that this, um, this works um, very well. If you compare these uh, electron densities to uh, the actual electron densities you would obtain when solving the quantum mechanics for those, um, you would um, hardly see the difference. Um, now, um, another uh, much more recent thing which just got accepted in science advances is that we also discovered a, a symmetry relation. Um, you see CO and OC are trivially symmetric, but if you go to a higher dimensions, for instance, benzene, you can um, change the composition in non-trivial ways. And here you see one benzene molecule, which has the doping pattern of NBBN, and below a benzene, which was doped with BNNB. And now a traditional uh, chemistry rules will tell you, well, these are two completely different uh, constitutional isomers. There's no symmetry operation you can apply to superimpose them, um, except for um, such a, a, a symmetry relation in the nuclear charge space. So if you change your, your nitrogen, um, uh, so you go from here to boron, 
um, or the boron from nitrogen, that's of course the same distance and nuclear charge. And so we call these two um, alchemical enantiomers. The corresponding electronic um, perturbed densities are shown here. You see they are virtually identical. And indeed, these two constitutional isomers are approximately up to third order um, uh, degenerate in their energy. So we call this an alchemical chirality. Right? Now, such relations are, are fairly unknown and they haven't been exploited yet, right? So within machine learning, we can um, implicitly um, make use of this. Now, <clears throat> coming now to, to the, the use case of machine learning, we have to um, rely mostly on uh, quantum results uh, for training and testing. And um, what you typically have is a hierarchy of methods, such as force field semi-empirical methods, Hartree-Fock methods, uh, perturbation, Hartree-Fock is a mean field method, perturbation-based approaches or explicitly correlate, correlated methods like quantum Monte Carlo or couple cluster. And depending on the level of theory you're using here, you will have to invest a lot of uh, CPU time. And uh, uh, now, if you are willing to invest this, your prediction in comparison to the experiment, to the experiment um, is going to increasingly become increasingly accurate, right? And so you have to negotiate uh, between the, the money you are willing to spend for CPU time and the accuracy um, you would like to obtain. Um, so this is a very well-known um, trade-off. And if you happen to find a new method which at constant cost um, it gets you uh, something more accurate, right? This might be a reason um, for you to get a ticket to, to Stockholm and, and meet, the, meet the king. Um, so this happened in, for density functional theory in 98. Um, <clears throat> now, using machine learning, we would like to sort of mimic this. We, we would like to exploit correlations among molecules or materials, and we would like to this method to become increasingly more accurate. And as the term implies, right, as it should be learning, which means as you provide more examples, it should become better, right? So uh, by construction, um, uh, monitoring our error as a function of training set size, this should be um, our figure of merit, uh, how we can validate and verify that the models do what, what we are hoping to. Now, once you train the model, the, the real appeal comes from uh, applying the trained model to new cases. And there you make a, a prediction um, error then that should resemble your, your training, um, the, the prediction error, the cross-validated error you, you've obtained in your training. Um, and so you can use this model then to uh, computationally very efficiently uh, make predictions um, for new compounds with high accuracy. And what we've observed is our gains in many orders of magnitudes and, and CPU time um, uh, while reaching uh, quantum accuracy. And that is, uh, that, that is really what got us very exciting. Um, this happened uh, roughly uh, 10 years ago uh, when um, we were at a, a workshop in a, an Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics, um, where I organized a, a program on navigating chemical compound space and with, with uh, friends and colleagues of mine, we, we managed to, to get this working. And so this uh, was in 2011 on the archive, if you uh, bother to look it up. Um, <clears throat> now, there's something really interesting. This picture I'm showing here is actually quite accurate in terms of machine learning uh, and in, in the flavor we like to use, which is a Kerner-Rich regression method. Now, Kerner-Rich regression methods would estimate some property of some material M <laughs> as a simple sum, a linear combination over your training instances. So if each point here in, in this simplex I'm showing up here, each point is a compound, you're basically just summing up all these compounds. You weigh each point um, by a regression coefficient alpha i, which carries the units of, of your property. And you multiply it with a, a similarity function, a kernel function, typically between zero and one, um, that uh, tells you how distant is your query compound from the training compound. So it's, it's a super simple, uh, very robust um, uh, model. Um, and there's a closed form solution for the regression coefficients shown here. You have to invert the kernel matrix spanned by all your training instances, right? So um, once you trained on this, you can make a new prediction anywhere 
uh, in between here and uh, that's very fast. Now Wapnick, um, who sort of formalized this approach in the 90s within statistical learning theory, he also showed with colleagues that the prediction error, um, the leading term of the prediction error must decay inversely with training set size. And this means if you logarithmize um, the error um, and uh, the training set size term, um, you should obtain a linear form. So this, this uh, pink arrow is actually quite accurate. This is how it should look like if your error and your training set size is being logarithmized, okay? So um, we've spent a lot of, uh, of our time over the last uh, couple of years in exploring how can we uh, improve the offset of such learning curves? How can we improve the slope? How can we avoid models that cease to learn? So uh, which uh, after some reaching some training sets are uh, set, uh, no longer learning. They are no longer machine learning models, right? Um, so um, I cannot tell you uh, everything about that, um, but I'd just like to briefly give you a glimpse on um, what um, is the impact on the functional form of the representation you pick for your compound. And this is shown here. So we've seen that in our work that the representation matters a lot. We've seen that uh, you can combine things with legacy quantum methods. So um, the, the methods like Hartree Fock or MP2 can be exploited. And uh, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If, if you already have some knowledge, some, some legacy method, it's possibly possible to exploit that. Um, and also, of course, the selection and scalability of your machine learning models is something which also dramatically affects these learning curves. Um, so here in this essay in 2018 in Angewandte, I, I sort of summarized my view on this uh, more recently in this Nature Chemistry Review, we, we gave sort of an overview on, on uh, where we think the field is at. Um, so just a, an example of how the representation affects these learning curves. These are um, errors, uh, mean absolute errors on atomization energies of organic molecules. It's a data set co called QM9, which my group published in 2014. Um, and it, it records for over 100,000 organic molecules, uh, all sorts of electronic properties. Now, uh, the Coulomb matrix called CM here is uh, one of these representations. This is the first one uh, we started with, and you see uh, obviously, uh, clearly, it's a linear curve here. You do have learning, right? It's a functional machine learning model. But with this representation, Bob, uh, it's just a different representation. Same kernel, same data set. Um, you uh, improve the offset dramatically, right? Um, and this kind of observation, uh, which we made in, in between 2012 and 2015, uh, continued to, uh, to be true uh, for further um, uh, representation, and there's a force field based representation. Um, then there was a, um, uh, a neural network by um, with Google. Um, then we had um, uh, an, a renewed neural network. Um, also here, um, this DTNN is a deep tensor neural network. Uh, more recently, these are kernel methods with um, new representation uh, based on distributions. Um, rather than on, on um, vectors, um, these are um, giving even better um, performance. And um, the, the most recent picture I have, and this is the one published in, in this review also, um, looks like this. And you see many different groups from all around the world contributed um, uh, models here, and they are sort of summarized here. Um, generally, um, among the best neural networks is, is this, uh, these purple squares here, but usually the kernel rich regression method, uh, for at least for this data set and this property, um, seem to outperform everybody else. Um, uh, this is uh, quite intriguing to us, and um, so some professors in the field uh, joined uh, forces to, uh, have, to define a, a QM9 challenge. So if you can come up with a model that would um, predict a machine learning model that will give this error here. So for 100 training instances, an error of um, this roughly chemical accuracy, then everyone on this list agreed to, to pay you each uh, $100. So, but of course, the, this model would be uh, extremely interesting. Now, <clears throat> today, um, 
and I, I'm not sure how much time I have left. Um, uh, I, I prepared things for three uh, recent papers. Um, I, I will probably just uh, briefly touch on them um, due to time. Uh, but um, I'd like to tell you um, that we, we've tackled um, reactions, um, we've tackled uh, free energies, and we've tackled the prediction of 3D structure, uh, always using uh, this, this kind of QML approach. So for reaction, um, we created a data set called QM Reaction, which was published last year. Um, uh, for And in particular, it's um, starting out with the same scaffold, we did an SN2 and an E2 reaction. So an elimination and a substitution reaction. Um, so you see the substitution to the left and the elimination to the right, and these are competing reactions. And uh, so using this data set, we, we were wondering if, if uh, we can uh, study this with machine learning. Here, here you see a distribution of the activation energy. I should uh, mention um, to those who are less familiar with chemistry that um, these barrier heights, um, they determine the, the kinetic stability, right? So you have a trade-off between thermodynamic stability, which means the energy difference between your, your reactant and the product. Um, so they are competing, right? But you also have um, to take into account the kinetic stabilization. So something that's uh, very high lying in, in a minimum, but which is surrounded by very high barriers will be of course very, very stable. Um, uh, and possibly stay more stable than a compound, uh, counterintuitively a compound which is lower lying, but which has lower barriers that, that the system can escape to an even deeper minimum somewhere else. So uh, these, um, um, these fundamental underlying uh, principles, of course, um, contribute to the richness uh, of, of chemistry and, and reactions. And so we were after um, tr trying to see if, if we can machine learn this. Um, so these were the, um, distributions of activation energies. And here you see some learning curves now of the activation energies. And um, you, you will notice we reached this level of MP2 accuracy, which for chemical reactions is a sort of state of the art in order to estimate these areas. And you see we have multiple machine learning models that differ by representation here, um, where we reach this um, uh, accuracy threshold already for a thousand uh, compounds or so. Um, another thing one can do with these reactions is to use a legacy method and what experimentalists very much like for reactive chemistry is known as the Hammett's equation. The Hammett's equation relates or postulates the relationship between the free energy difference um, or um, also um, the, um, the equilibrium constant to um, a product of two factors. One uh, row stands for the reaction types, so in our case, uh, elimination or substitution. The um, other uh, factor, sigma, typically stands for the chemical composition. And we wanted to see if, if this simple ansatz um, also performs for this data set. Um, now you can uh, build a whole um, system of equations and then uh, optimize, treat the sigmas as um, regression coefficients uh, in a linear system of equations. And like this, you can even out uh, the noise, of course. Um, and that's something we did uh, for the two reactions, um, uh, elimination and substitution. Um, and then uh, we can make predictions for new compounds. So this is shown here in the last uh, equation, a typical Hammett prediction would be uh, for, for the activation energy of a new um, reactant I here. You need the uh, minimum energy and then uh, some reference um, uh, information, right, from other reactions. And like this, you go, you, you predict basically through compound space uh, reactive property. Um, so Hammett was uh, is, is 80 years old, uh, 100 years maybe. Um, uh, so um, there's a very well established, uh, very empirical approach. Um, and we see, thanks to our overall um, optimization, including all. Uh, training instances, we can uh, get a, a better um, uh, scatter plot with, with the two uh, numbers. Um, and uh, overall, for different leaving groups and nucleophiles, you see here uh, the overall error um, over different, com more conventional ways is, is uh, favorable. Um, we can also have a learning curve. So if, if you learn um, the um, activation energy directly, you, you get this red curve. If you use Hammett as a baseline, you learn the diff a correction to Hammett, you gain a lot in particular for small uh, training set sizes. Um, and 
this is very relevant because often in, in for, for tricky, difficult properties, you have um, uh, very few data sets. Now, um, <clears throat> let me switch gears. Uh, this is a different paper, um, which just came out, I think last week, um, where we looked at learning free energies. Um, and uh, in particular, um, we realized there are some properties where, um, and free energies are among them, where, where you would require a cost and representation. Let me qualify, this tells you here, is a number, uh, a frequency analysis um, of different conformers and the, um, the molecular graphs are plotted here. So these are different molecules and they have different conformers. And for each conformer, you can use a model to predict its solvation energy, okay, for each configuration. And, and so you see here how this uh, solvation energy uh, estimate varies as you go through these conformers and you see a lot of variance in here. And um, this is very um, scary because um, uh, depending on which uh, conformer you, you pick, right, you, you might be off by 4K kappa mode. Uh, so for instance, in this purple case here, uh, in your free energy of solvation, which is a very substantial number. Um, so for free energies, of course, what we should, what we ought to do really is to sample phase space. And so um, what, what is required is the calculation of, of an, uh, an expectation value like this. Um, and this really means that we should um, use as a representation something that is Boltzmann sampled, and we can do that by running molecular dynamics and then averaging over these um, coordinates, right? And so you would have an average of an isomer I, A, an average of an isomer B, et cetera, for each compound and compound space. And then you build a machine learning model to infer the average of a new query isomer is shown here in pink. Uh, so that was the idea of this paper and it worked very well. We, we call it the, the free uh, energy machine learning, so FML. Um, and so we used as a training set experimental data, the free solve database uh, published by Mobley and, and co-workers. And you see here the distribution. Um, unfortunately, there are less than 500 molecules. Uh, these are experimental numbers, so this is very costly. Um, and uh, we, we uh, can run molecular dynamics on these compounds, generate um, uh, the, the average uh, representation, and then use the experimental solvation energies here as a label to train our coefficients. And then we can make a prediction for a new compound. You first have to run a short MD uh, for your query compound, and then you use that as a representation to predict um, the free energy of solvation for the new query. Um, now, how well does this work? Here you see learning curves come systematically down. Here in red is, is the ensemble one. Um, you see in green and orange here common um, models. So um, something based on the ECFP4 representation, which is a common graph-based model, or the CQ, which is another common um, representation, um, have worse learning curves. Um, in terms of scatter plots, um, you see that um, this FML performs very well. And we also have a table here. So one of the most popular methods in the field is COSMO. And uh, you see it, it predicts at best 0 0.52, um, an error of 0 0.52. Um, and um, you see that FML here predicts 0 0.57. And, and that is for a fixed training set size, right? So, Cosmo is, is sort of converged in, in the sense it's not a machine learning model, but if we had more training data, our learning curves would suggest that we could uh, achieve even better accuracy. Um, we can um, use this model then to um, uh, predict solvation energies for all of QM9, right? And this is what you should see here now. There's a distribution of all the energies of solvation for QM9. Um, and we can see that uh, here in pink is highlighted, these are all uh, hydrocarbons, right? So we can uh, locate uh, clusters depending on compositions and, and an important property like this in chemical compound space. Um, so the, the extreme compounds we predict based on this model are shown here. So the most solvable and the least solvable are, are here. So some are even repulsive according to the model that will just fly out of your aqueous solution <laughs> according to this model. Um, and we can recover typical trends, so hydrogen donors or NH or H groups, they, uh, they affect your, your, their number affects the solvation energy 
and these are trends we can rediscover. If, you, if we had not known about such trends, we could rediscover it this way, right? Um, so um, this is um, then finally uh, something we would uh, compare to. If this was our training data set, you see we um, reach here much more data in this 10 to 20 um, uh, kcalpa more window thanks to a machine learning model trained on um, a distribution which is rather between the zero and one, um, okay, uh, zero and 10. Okay, um, Matthias uh, switched on his camera. I think this means I should stop. Is, is this uh, correct or, or do I have a little bit more time? I, so if you if you have a concluding slide, that's fine, but we really have to stop uh, now in the next minute. Okay, so let me um, skip this third paper I wanted to tell you about. Unfortunately, I, I um, spent a, a little bit too much time in the beginning, but I hope um, that helped to, to better explain things. Um, so in this third paper, we um, used machine learning to reconstruct uh, geometries of uh, to predict new geometries given a graph as an input. And also here we have some learning curves, but I, I will not discuss this in, in detail. We call this the graph to structure machine GPS. So in summary, um, so we have the laws of physics um, on which we can rely, right? It, it makes um, me, uh, uh, so I, I, I'm not awake at night worrying about the, the uh, correctness of our approach because I know we, we can fall back to these laws of physics and that's a, a very comfort, comfortable position. And I, I told you about these learning curves. I, I hope you, you saw a little bit how useful and powerful they are. Yeah, I think they are, um, uh, they, they are tremendous in assessing uh, the, the performance of uh, these models. And you can think about um, what is happening here conceptually. Um, if, if you're wondering, is this just an incremental thing now or is this really a revolution? Um, I would argue what, what you have is, of course, uh, the traditional sciences started out with the experiment. Then we built some theory uh, such as uh, statistical and, and quantum mechanics. Um, and then over the last decades, we um, had uh, computers come, come to, to the world, right? And we use them in, in simulation, in numerical simulation. And now we have, um, thanks to having access to more data, we can actually really make use of statistics, right? And so that's like, a, for me, this is the fourth pillar in, in, of science now that we have a, an additional um, pillar here where we can build surrogate models um, that really um, exploit um, the, the data that becomes increasingly more available. So um, seeing the fact that we can control accuracy and that we get speed ups by orders of magnitudes, I believe it's, it's rather revolution, but of course that's a, a personal take. Um, so uh, most of the methods we develop uh, end up in this QML code. It's on the GitHub if, if you wish to contribute or use it, uh, please feel free. Um, we also uh, published a, a book uh, last uh, year in, in the lecture notes in physics there are many people in the field that uh, contributed chapters. So if, if you want to delve uh, more into the, the physics uh, based uh, applications, that, that might also be a good place to start. And then finally, I, I should um, disclose that I'm editor in a new journal by the, uh, published by the Institute of Physics in, in the UK uh, called Machine Learning Science and Technology. So if, if you, this is a, not a machine learning journal, journal, but a, a journal meant to be for this interdisciplinary space where machine learning methods can be developed. Um, also here, there's uh, many scientists are on the editorial board. So if you have a paper where, where you um, think uh, that uh, machine learning has helped with your respective science, this might be a good venue to, to consider. And finally, I should acknowledge the people who actually did the work. So uh, they are highlighted here in pink. Um, in particular, um, Marco did uh, the reaction work with the Hammett equation, as well as uh, Stefan Heinen here, and uh, Dominic Lem, Lem did the um, structure prediction, and Jan Van Rijk the um, solvation, and Guido von Rudolph uh, and, and Nick Browning uh, helped uh, uh, supervising these PhD students. I uh, enjoy uh, receiving a lot of funding for now, so I have to acknowledge these agencies. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention, of course. Thank you very much. <laughs>